So welcome on board to the 2021 first podcast for Business Unusual, Top Coast Business Unusual. And I'm very excited for our guest today. It's Fazani um, Muraleka from the CEO of African Bank. Um, Fazani, I think that I don't, you don't know this, but I had a meeting with City about two years ago. We were doing a project called Africa Tech Week, and we were looking at how digital transformation is going to impact every business in the world. And they were looking at partnering us. And they told me about your crusade at recruiting data scientists. And it was two years ago, I was like, wow, I wanna to speak to this woman who's transforming the banking sector, essentially in my eyes, and, and really driving change before we've had this COVID initiative. And, and I suppose the question is, what was, what was your thinking about being so uh, forward, forward thinking in terms of digital transformation, trans transforming the bank. Hi, Ralph, and thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, when I became CEO, um, I definitely had a bee in my bonnet about just how quickly digital was transforming the world or technology was transforming the world. So shortly after I became CEO, I then had a strategy session with my team in Cape Town and we had this fantastic group of people facilitated. And we came out of there with a very strong understanding of the fact that if we don't get ahead of this thing, or at least try to get ahead of this thing, we'll get, very far, get, we'll get left very far behind. As a result, we decided coming out of that to prioritize three things. The first was culture, the next was customer centricity, and the third was data. And the logic behind that was, we know that data is increasingly more important, and we know that the ability to use data, analyze data, to anticipate customer needs, to drive your project, your, your product development, um, to access different markets was very important. And to be able to do that successfully, we had to get data scientists on board. Now, I have been so lucky. Um, in part of the team that I, um, I, I inherited, from the previous CEO, we have, um, he's not a data scientist, but definitely he's a guy who loves data. Um, I often say that he's probably two parts machine and one part human. Um, mm -hmm. So he's our head of data scientists, his name is Veer. Um, and, and, and he's been the guy who's been driving um, the, this academy that we created, that we built um, together with a company called Explore. Through that, we have graduated now two cohorts of data scientists, We've also recruited a whole lot more. And as a result, we are building our own cohort um, or our own team of very strong data scientists to ensure that we remain relevant to our customers into the future. For sure. And I mean, no one predicted sort of COVID happening and the impact that's happened. And I know that you've been on that digital journey for quite a while. I mean, ha are you seeing it's coming to some fruition? Are you seeing some benefits of that digital transformation, that initial investment inside of data and digital transformation? So absolutely. So I suppose, as you know, credit is our bread and butter. Um, and our ability to be smarter than anybody else um, in the room at identifying the right customers, giving them the right size loan for the right term and so on. I mean, that's absolutely the thing that we are best at doing. And that this more and more requires data sciences um, and machine learning. So um, from that perspective, the guys are already adding enormous amounts of value. The second part of it is collections. So if you're going to lend the money out, you've got to collect it. And the strategies that have been run um, through analysis of various information about our customers in order to collect better is unbelievable. Um, we've seen that we have our collections has barely dipped um, during the lockdown period. And as you can imagine, that's an incredible achievement given the fact that unemployment was, was ramping up people's disposable income was ramping up. And the guys were very clever in anticipating this and coming up with different strategies to approach it. So that's really, really been good. The third thing I'll talk about around our data scientists is that from, I think almost from the beginning, um, there was a lot of focus on voice analytics. Um, so we have a pretty big contact center. And the idea was there's an enormous amount of data that comes out of that, of that contact center because customers are talking about different things. Uh, and if we had that information, we would be better able to understand what our customer needs were. And secondly, we know that if we had access to how our people are talking to our customers, if we had access to, how, to what our best um, agents are doing that our worst performing agents are not doing, we could then actually figure out how to make sure that all our agents um, have the right tools at hand to be able to be really good and various other things, right? And um, so in the last, I think in November last year, 
We were the first bank in South Africa to partner with Core Miner, which is a leader in voice analytics in the world. Um, and they're gonna help us to transcribe each and every single call, which will enable us to achieve all the various things I've just spoken to you about now. Um, and all of this will help us with customer acquisition, with service, um, and obviously in the long run of profitability. So I'm really excited about what we're seeing coming out of those teams. And I know this is just the beginning. It's, it's super exciting, eh? I'm like, I can feel it. And, and I think you get that sense, it's, uh, it's a sustainable long-term thing. It's not a quick fix because you've got to get the right people and, and work in it. I mean, some of the things, because there's people out there who are going to be listening to this and saying, that's fantastic. But, you know, that took some conviction in you and belief. And, and I wonder where that came from. Is that from reading books? Is that from, I mean, some of the books that I read was like Salim Ishmael's Exponential Organizations that sort of... Yeah gave me insights into those companies that were thriving and how they were using data and, and dashboards and digitization. What was your inspiration? For this, I actually think mostly um, it was just the, and I, I guess it's a lot of the reading we were doing. Oh, I read a book called Digital Human. That's maybe the starting point. Digital Human. And, yeah. Digital Human. Yeah. Um, and in this book, um, I can't remember the author's name now, but initially he'd written a, a, a book called Digital Bank. Yeah. Um, and he talks about how we are increasingly using data and how we are using data and how digital is gonna take over the world. And he built this very compelling image of what a bank must look like in the future. So we know that banks more and more are gonna compete with Facebook and Google and the big, the, the, the fans, right? The big technology yeah. companies. Um, we all want that same experience, the same ease of use, with the right privacy um, and, and yeah. security <laughs> protocols. Um, so we all want that. And if that's what I want, it takes time to build it, which is why we decided as a team that if we're gonna get there, we really need to start now. Then secondly, the people who really inspired this, who really kind of took it over the edge, were the consultants we were using um, at the time to help us to craft our strategy. They really understood the environment. Um, and they're very passionate about the bank as well, which I think is fantastic. So we continue mm -hmm. to work with them. Um, to make sure that we are, um, you know, we, we remain on the right journey, we keep ourselves accountable, and we're setting the right keep it honest. Um, metrics. To, right, the, the right metrics as well um, to measure our progress and make sure that we co we're continuing to do the right things. So, do you think like consultants and outside help is important? I mean, Salim sort of says that the best brains for a company sit outside the organization. In other words, you can tap into the customer and other clients. I mean, this yeah. sort of sounds like what you did as well. I love that idea. What, an, what a fantastic notion. So we decided that customer centricity matters, right? So if you're not listening to your customers, you're going to lose them. Um, yeah. And if you aren't listening to consumers in general, you, you can't acquire more customers. So we definitely haven't thought of them as being the best, the best brains outside our, our, our company, but I definitely like the idea. Um, so I suppose we, we all have different experiences with consultants. Some are great, some are really not great, even after paying them millions of rand. Um, but I think with these particular consultants, um, it's called the Field Institute. We did really well. Um, they really spent, they spent an enormous amount of time and energy understanding what's happening globally, understanding what's happening in South Africa, and then figuring out how to locate us in all of that. And then we work together to figure out how we, you know, build the right, um, the right direction um, and the right execution fra um, framework to get us to where we want to go. I mean, I mean Salim in his book, talks around massive transformative purpose. And I know that you, you've sort of created this purpose for the bank. And, and do you think that, that that was like the core of you getting to the customer and using data? Do you think that was, those are some of the core things that led out these values, these important milestones? So um, I suppose the, the paths around kind of using data and digital, those were much more related to how do we become relevant to our customers in the future. But you know, yeah. your point about purpose um, is so important, Rolf. So I've, I've often said that the reason I joined African Bank was just because of this culture and its people. You know, so I, yeah. I had uh, been an non-executive director for a few years and I really loved the management team. I loved how they worked together. I loved that every time I, I, I showed up at the bank, the, the energy and, and the people just really appealed to me. And when I joined as, a, as, a, as an executive, I only became more convinced of that. Um, and I think it is because the bank is inherently purpose-driven. So if you, if, you, if you were to speak to the founders of African Bank, um, so the, the, the guys who founded it in 1975, they would say to you that they founded the bank because they wanted to create financial services for black people living in townships who otherwise would not have access to it. 
right? So this is about serving those who otherwise would not have service. And I think that credo and that thread has run through everything that we do because then it's not just about serving them, it's about serving them well, it's about evolving with them. Um, and so when we sat down and, and thought, well, how do we frame this purpose um, in a way that will uh, appeal and galvanize our people to act? We came up with this purpose of advancing lives through financial and related services because that's what we want to do right you want to mm -hmm. take people who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities and help them to access new opportunities yeah i, th I think what we're seeing is purpose is, is sort of uh, core to a lot of things but i mean even the these things that i'm seeing with the banks so some of your billboards about you know the, the best uh, interest rate there's, there's so many it's, it seems that you're picking the very best ideas or, or philosophies or principles. Um, you're very targeted in terms of your approach. You know you want to serve that customer and you're going to get a very compelling offer in terms of the best interest rate and giving the best service. I mean, yeah. is, that, is that something that you brought to the table? Is that a team effort? Where, where does that sort of come from? Because it, it, it almost seems, um, you know, in, in terms of South African, it, it's very advanced. Um, you yeah. sort of see those sort of principles possibly in the States or the UK, but it seems very advanced and very clear and purpose driven. Um, I'm so glad you say that. You know, Ralph, often we say we connect the dots backwards. <laughs> so I think, you know, we knew coming out of curatorship that we had to build a deposit base, a very strong deposit base. Um, and primarily because we wanted to achieve two things. One was to get South Africans to start, start trusting us with their money. Because you can imagine um, the brand needed some rehabilitation. And then secondly, um, we needed to, to have a much more robust balance sheet. So pre-curatorship, um, the bank had relied mostly for its funding from the institutions. Um, and because we were able to lend at very high interest rates, we could then um, borrow money from other institutions at very, very high rates and pay them very high rates. As a result, our funding was very expensive. So it was about 4% higher than what other banks were paying in the market. So we knew that to try and get that funding rate down, we would need to have average people in the street giving us their money because the average rate of funding from depositors is a lot lower. So we've been thrilled to find that, to, to get to a point where more than 35% of our funding is now from retail depositors. This has increased from about two, 3% in 2017, so three years wow. ago. So it, it truly is an extraordinary achievement. And we knew that to achieve that, we would have to pay up. So we are still paying more than what the other banks would pay you for your retail deposits, but we, it's certainly a lot less than what we would be paying if we were getting all our money from institutions. So it's, I think that's unbelievable. That's absolutely one of the best stories of the last three years that we've been able to, to, to achieve this um, and to get more, so many more South Africans thinking about the bank and actually engaging with the bank. So I think that's, um, that's truly awesome. And, and I suppose the saving, savings culture, I think that um, it's something that, that certainly we need to be thinking about. Um, how do we save more? How do we invest more? Um, yeah. And so I think you've indirectly changed behaviors and in a way the culture of I must tell you, I, I love that point. So one of the campaigns that our social media team ran, I think it was last year, Maybe it was the year before. 2020 was such a complex time. Let's go with the year before. It was a happier time. Three years in one. <laughs> You're right, exactly. Um, so I think in, in 2019, um, they ran this campaign on social media about how about building you a roadmap to save for your special occasion. So saving for your wedding dress, saving for your, um, your degree, your education, saving for your child's education, whatever it was, saving for your holiday. Um, and what they would do is they would help you to build a roadmap to this thing. And you could see the excitement on social media, people engaging with this notion of, oh my gosh, you know, if I save X amount of money and I get X amount paid in interest, I can actually get to where I want to go. Um, so I do hope, you know, through these, through these little initiatives that we've had over the last few years that we have contributed to increasing the saving culture in the country. Yeah, I certainly want to get more into that. But I mean, you know, just talking around the curatorship quickly, I mean, it seems that you've taken, a, you know, a fairly hard uh, situation and turned it around to your benefit. And I almost get a sense that when I speak to successful people like yourself, that's a common thread that seems to come through in their life in general is taking challenging opportunities and turning it to your advantage. And 
Um, I know that you, <laughs> as a young girl, went to boarding school. I also went to boarding school. You went a little bit younger than I did. Um, <clears throat> eight, I think, when you went to boarding school. Was it eight? I went when I was 11 years old, and I ran away, and I got all the way home, and it was snowing. <laughs> So I sort of I became a good runner and sports person because of that, but um, I stuck it out for another four years. But I mean, how was your experience at boarding school? How did, how did you find that? Because I mean, if I look at you know, and it's probably been you know over celebrated. I'm not sure, but as a first black female CEO of a bank in South Africa, um, it is an amazing accolade. It really is. And it's no easy feat either. And I think there's a lot of people who are thinking, well, how did you do it? You know, what, what is, what did it take? And I know there's no easy answer, but, but certainly, you know, I'd love to hear some of that journey of your, your father, your upbringing, your siblings. Um, we, we know it obviously runs in the family as well. Your, your sister, congratulations to it, was just made the Thank Auditor you. General of South Africa. I mean, that is a staggering sort of, if I'm going to bet on a family, I'm going to bet in your family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it, Rolf. If you were to ask my younger sister, she would say that the reason I, I became CEO is because I was trying to chase my older sister, yeah. um, who at the time was effectively the CEO of the Auditor General's office. Um, and she may not be wrong, by the way. But yeah. um, I think boarding school, <laughs> Sylvan rivalry is a, is a very powerful thing. Um, Look, I mean, I uh, boarding school sucked. I mean, I, I was eight years old. Um, I could barely speak English. And suddenly I found myself in a sea of white faces in 1987. Um, so I, I, did, I definitely didn't enjoy it. But certainly it was a massive challenge and I had to overcome it. All right. Yeah. And a big part of that was learning how to speak the language. So, you know, actually learning English, but also the language of being in a private school, the language of being in that environment, which is so different from my own. And when I look at my life, I think so much of it has been about that. It's been, it's been about being thrown into the deep end of something strange and finding my way out of it. Um, so, you know, even with um, getting into, in, in, into African Bank. So, I mean, I, I joined as the, as the non-executive in 2015 because Louis Van Zeno, who was the chairman at the time, you know, phoned me and said, look, I would like you to think about this thing, um, which I did. Um, and Louis at the time said to me, you know, Basani, if we do a good job with African Bank, we can turn it into an investic for people on the margins of our society or people who are, um, you know, not in the mainstream of our, of our economy. Um, and I just remember that as being a very powerful drive, right? Because I do feel very strongly that we need to figure out how to resolve our poverty problems, how to resolve our inequality issues. Um, and Libby just had a brilliant vision and, and I agreed with it. So that's why I joined. And then of course I mentioned to you that I then became an executive after that. Um, and I think, you know, when you say, how do you get there? It's mm. undoubtedly about the people. Yes, absolutely, the, your childhood experiences as well, um, you know, kind of forge a certain determination and so on. But I think mm. I've just been surrounded by the most awesome people. So my mm. father was an attorney um, and you can imagine getting all of his, of his four children through private school um, in the 1980s, not an easy feat. Um, at that time. So he worked extremely hard. We barely saw him, uh, but he was just so motivated, so driven, so entrepreneurial. And I think all of those things landed in all of us and just an extraordinary leader. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think about my dad, I, I often think about the many times I would see him giving speeches and founding this thing or the other thing, just an incredible leader. Um, and one of the things that maybe um, really created my sense of place and space in the world was that <clears throat> when we were when we were in Sochanguve, so I, I, was, I was born in Sochanguve, which is just north of Pretoria. Um, I remember whenever there would be riots, which at some point felt like every single weekend, and you've got these massive caspers, you've got the tear gas and so on, and it's just like chaos. Um, the very next day, there would be like this long snaking queue um, at my home with people coming to see my dad to ask them for help in finding their kids who had been arrested or had gone missing and so on. And as a result, you know, I think for all of us, we ended up getting a very strong sense that our place in the world is to leave it better than what we found it. Our place in the world is to make a difference um, to, the, you know, to the plight of others, um, because you know, without that, really, what are we doing? So you know, as a result, you know, I think he was probably 
okay, undoubtedly my biggest champion and my kind of strongest motivator. Um, and then after that, he introduced us to many other people who played that role for us and continue to, thank goodness. And then of course, from a professional perspective, um, having been at first Rand for five years, I mean, between James Formby, Herman Bosman, Paul Harris, Susan Nassana, you know, these people played an incredible role in telling me that actually we believe in your potential uh, and we want you to be successful. And then I think finally, when Louis von Zeno and, and, and um, Brian Riley made a call, so those two gentlemen were at, 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 um, at um, African Bank and, and made the call to appoint me as, as CEO, um, you know, I think them having had the faith, the, the trust, the belief. I mean, what an amazing opportunity. It seems that, um, you know, I, I obviously you know, knew I was gonna be speaking to you and I did a lot of research and I, and I kind of maybe over-researched but then I started researching your dad and I realized, wow, um, what it sounds like, I, I've never met him, but it sounds like an awesome person. Um, he set up the Black Lawyers Association in 1975. He mentored the president. Um, <laughs> how's that? That's, that's absolutely thinking, true. And I was thinking, if you mentored the president, then gee, how did he mentor you? And so I, you know, I just get this overwhelmingly, and I think that's why I was so excited. I was so excited because I also wanted to find out some of the things, some of the lessons, the principles that he shared with you. Um, I think also what comes across often is that, you know, looking at your profile, you are very studious, you're hardworking and you're academically inclined. And, and you know, you've got the MBA at Kellogg and, you know, you've got all these sort of um, academic accolades. But then, you know, when you read about your father who owned the, the supermarket store, he was, he, he really was an entrepreneur who was, yeah. and that sense of getting to know the customer, that was part of your culture. It wasn't that you just talking, it's like you, that's what the family did. And so, um, and those were ingrained when you were a really young girl. So, I mean, what, what, what do you, what can you, what can you say you learned from that, that, that experience of, yeah. Are you proud of that part of things, um, the entrepreneur as well? No, absolutely. My father was extraordinary. He passed down three years ago. Um, so, I'm sorry about that. you know, it, yeah. thank you. I mean, look, it, it's a, it's, it was a terrible loss, but also an opportunity to think through just how blessed we were to have him. Um, so, one of the things I often think about um, is the story that a lot of people tell was that when I was small, I would follow my father everywhere. I'd imitate his walk, I'd imitate how he talked to people. Um, and every, I think it was every Sunday or every Saturday evening, I'd go to the, the, to the shops with him, to the grocery store that we owned in um, the jungle there. And I'd like kind of like follow him and hang onto his legs. And I'd watch him talk to almost every single customer in the shop. As he would walk through, he would know them by name. He would know their story. He would ask them about so-and-so and so-and-so, how did this go? I mean, he just was amazing, it was just this man, this force that everybody knew, everybody admired, and it was because they believed in, in his ability to help them to make their lives better, right? Imagine that. Um, so in, in my eulogy to my dad, after he passed, I said, in many ways, in my mind, he was the president, the president of Toshangude, right? Because he was just so well known and was so committed to the lives of those people. And I think that's what forces you to kind of, that's the, those, those things, those experiences make you think hard about the importance of looking after people. Yeah. Um, and I do think, you know, human beings are here to look after people, after each other. I mean, if we've learned nothing else from COVID, it's our interconnectedness. Um, and mm -hmm. I think I learned that from him. Then the second lesson from my dad um, is that I, in my natural state, speak very, very fast. <laughs> um, it is what it is. And if I get to a point where I'm speaking too fast, then I stutter and then it's a mess. Um, so, and I, I really struggled with this, particularly in my teens. So I had to give a speech for something. It may have been my sister's wedding and um, I was speaking just after my dad and he knew how nervous I was. So as he comes off the stage, he takes me by the shoulder and he says to me, just be deliberate. Um, and I feel like since then, I, my public speaking capabilities have just continued to improve, right? If you can stop and breathe and believe that people wanna hear what you have to say, you'll be fine even if you're not necessarily saying the most uh, profound things. 
Um, and then of course, the, the last thing that was important for me with my dad. So when I came back from business school, um, so I now had this MBA from this glitzy institution and mm -hmm. my father was just so blown away and so excited, you know, about this, the fact that I'd done it. Um, and he said to us, oh, he said, so then at some point I was having a career issue. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my career. And I was asking him, like, listen, I'm stuck. What should I do? And he says to me, I can't help you anymore. You need to phone this one and this one and this one and go and figure out what you need to do. And that's a gift, right? The ability to say, I, I believe I've reached the end of the line and being able to assist here, but there are so many people who can do it. And I think those lessons have really been meaningful for me. So awesome. Wow. Th thanks for sharing that. I was really looking forward to get, getting some cool. insights there. But I mean, one of the other things is, you know, I looked at doing an MBA as well, and you've done an MBA. And then I look at your investment in, in, in people who haven't gone through the traditional school university system with these data scientists. And again, it's yeah. something that sort of interests me, data, insights, that sort of stuff. I mean, what are you, where are you seeing the future opportunities in South Africa in terms of upskilling people from sort of marginalized or people who haven't had the same solution? Are you, are you seeing a bigger opportunity now with digitization and looking at skills as opposed to maybe an education that's looking yeah. at knowledge? So I've had the privilege of being um, a founding trustee of the Click Foundation. So the Click Foundation was founded by Nicola Harris, um, I think in 2014 it was. And what that foundation does is that it, um, it works across the country in different schools, no, mostly not, not non-fee paying schools, so public schools. Um, and it delivers a product, it's an online product that we deliver. Um, so we, we actually either give them laptops if they don't already have laptops um, and we load this, pro this program on. It's called Reading Aids and effectively kids put on earphones um, and they're allowed to go through the process of learning English um, at their own pace um, through this program. And it's incredibly effective. We found that kids who use reading eggs typically perform better at school than kids who don't use reading eggs. So it really has worked well. Um, and also she's managed, Nicola has managed to bring down the cost of um, doing this over time as well, which makes it infinitely scalable, which I think is great. The other thing that um, the Flick Foundation has started doing as well is to start is with, uh, is to introduce mathematics and numeracy. Into, in, in, into schools. Now, I really do think that, you know, to, we have to leverage technology. Um, I think we um, have to make sure that at the very, very minimum, um, our kids are numerate and that they're literate. Um, and then I think after that, we need to figure out how we create, I would say, shorter courses. You know, yeah. so maybe you, you can't spend a full 12 years in school. So yeah. how do you make sure though, that you can have bite-sized courses that you can do online, in your own time, but over time you can, you know, work towards having a metric or the equivalent of a metric. And then I think after that, it has to be the same for us. So one of the things I worry a lot about my business and about me in particular is that um, I do I believe in the notion that the success of an organization will be determined by the velocity of its learning. Yeah. So how quickly your people upskill themselves um, and how quickly leaders have skill themselves it's going to determine whether or not we become successful in the future and that's tough you know mm. when you're running a business and you feel like you barely have a minute for yourself to then want to pursue a phd or to pursue you know i don't know learning some other um difficult discipline it just isn't there and i think we need to figure out how we create these accessible bite-sized courses that in it, that that are easy to access you know not so easy to access both in terms of getting to them but also intellectually so that people can um, continually learn and relearn and end. I, I know I, I, I kind of get the assumption that you have invested in the Click Foundation because you're an avid reader. Um, have you always been a big reader? Yes, um, I absolutely have. Well, maybe let me say from Senate 8. So what, that's grade nine these days. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what are my memories about my dad in grade nine? So I didn't really like school. My older sister liked school. She was really good at it and I hated her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got to grade eight and or to standard eight and I started doing the, my, own, my own courses. So you can choose your own subjects. And mm -hmm. I loved them. I found that I was so happy. And as a result, I started reading. And I liked it so much that um, I was in boarding school, as you know, and I'd come home every Saturday. And every Saturday I'd get home um, and I'd sit at the dining room table, lay out all my books and just start reading and drinking copious amounts of coffee. 
So on one of these Saturdays, my father comes home in the middle of the afternoon and there I am on my own, just enjoying, you know, immersing myself in these books. And he says to me, you can't become a boring teenager. This is not going to happen. So he gave me money and said, go, I <laughs> don't care where you go, just go. Um, so I think that was, yeah, the year that I discovered this is something that I really love to do. Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd left school already when I, my brother was also an avid reader. He'd read a book a day and I'd oh go play gosh. football or do something else. And only after school did I start reading. It was funny, but now I read a lot. Now I read a lot because I think being, you know, being a leader of an organization, you have to keep pace. And I think you need inspiration. You're looking for insights. Uh, yeah. Picking up that positive attitude. Um, and then I think it gets more addictive, right? Absolutely. And there's so many good books. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to not want to read them um, and to hear what people are doing differently. And, and now so many people are writing about, and not just books um, and articles, people are writing about how to lead an organization that has become virtual overnight. Um, yeah. And that for me is a, is a huge issue. You know, um, It's very easy to kind of sit in my home and think everybody's fine. Uh, but you know, that's obviously not true. Um, and it's a question of figuring out how do you get the, you know, the, the pulse of the business when you're so far away from it? Um, how do you communicate more effectively um, in, the, in the midst of this? And I've been loving all the insights that are out there. For sure. But what I saw is, is my 14 year old, he loves computers, he loves games, all those sorts of things, very intelligent, loves cooking, but he doesn't like reading. And so and <laughs> over the holidays, that was a big challenge. And I, and I realized I had to read him a book and then he got excited about it once I started helping him oh, read. Nice. Um, That's so extraordinary. That's a big challenge as well with young people. They're so distracted with their, their phones and their gadgets and their 